Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please share the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating a Kaverian shrinkage procedure developed by Ledwa and Wolf in 2004 in the famous paper that deals with the noise in Kaverian's matrix optimization with loads of assets and not so many time periods. To inform our current example, we have got 14 US stocks, all members of the S&P 500, over a course of five years at monthly frequency. So the first thing would be to calculate their monthly returns, dividing prices today by prices yesterday, dividing prices this month by prices last month, and subtracting one. Essentially, we can enforce them throughout all 14 stocks and throughout all 60 months. The idea is that we can now count how many time periods we have bought, just counting how many rows there are in our data, and count how many columns there are as well. So 14 stocks, 60 months, and uh, ultimately it's very common in uh, uh, finance applications for portfolio management that you might have got not so many time periods, especially with monthly data, but loads of assets. There are thousands of assets available to you to trade, but there might be only, say, 60 months you have got data on them for. And that is a problem, because if you estimate a covariance matrix with more assets than time periods, then it wouldn't be invertible due to insufficient rank. And uh, that poses a problem for uh, portfolio management, as you cannot really use, say, uh, efficient portfolio frontier calculations. You cannot come up with the dangerous portfolio, minimum variance portfolio. But uh, even more importantly, uh, the more assets there are in respect to uh, time periods, um, the noisier the covariance matrix becomes, even if it's invertible. In our case, it would definitely be invertible, but there will be a lot of noise associated with having to estimate lots of pairwise correlations between the assets. And uh, uh, a lot of criticism directed towards modern portfolio theory and portfolio optimization tools stems from the fact that those become estimation noise maximizers. Essentially, the model picks up noise in, uh, associated with imperfect estimation of covariances or correlations and amplifies it, uh, believing that it's a genuine opportunity to diversify or hedge. And the ingenuity of Ledwine and Wolf was to come up with a procedure that shrinks the covariance matrix to get rid of this noise, or to at least to mitigate the impact this noise would have on, say, optimal portfolio weights in some optimization procedure. The idea that Ledwine and Wolf came up with is to shrink the sample covariance matrix, that would be the covariance matrix that we would have estimated normally, by diluting it with the identity matrix that is just a, a unit matrix scaled by average variance of assets. Essentially, this is an information problem in the sense that uh, we do know some sample uh, covariance structure, but we know that there is a lot of noise there. And what is the ultimate non-noisy uh, estimator of covariance? Well, it's presuming all correlations are roughly zero and all variances are roughly the same. So that would be a very agnostic um, approach to the structure of covariance between your assets. And now the problem is to understand how much information there is in our sample covariance matrix and how much noise there is to determine the optimal uh, scaling of the uh, unity matrix and the sample covariance matrix. But first things first, let's estimate the sample covariance matrix. For that, we'll need the average monthly stock returns. And we also need sample variances for later use. So let's just estimate them here. And for this particular application, let us use the matrix uh, multiplication approach to covariance matrix uh, calculation. So I'll simply subtract stock specific means from their monthly returns. So 
let's use the matrix multiplication approach to calculate the sum of covariance matrix. So we'll matrix multiply the transposed matrix of D mean returns and the matrix of D mean returns themselves. And for the sample adjustment, we'll need to divide it by number of periods minus one. Uh, again, I've got a separate video that talks about uh, estimations of covariance matrix using different methods in Excel. So check this out if you're interested in the basics. So here we have got um, a 14 by 14 symmetric matrix uh, of sample covariances between assets with obviously variances on the diagonal. Now let's figure out our identity matrix or our agnostic uh, estimation of the covariance structure that basically presumes we know nothing about the assets whatsoever, apart from the fact what their average variance is. And this has got a parameter mu associated with it in the letter on the wolf paper. So let's just calculate average variances across our 14 assets, and we come up with a mu of 0 0.01. Now for the uh, identity matrix, there's a second uh, component that will wait. We'll simply need to calculate a unit matrix of dimension 14 and times it by mu. That results in a, a matrix with zeros everywhere apart from the diagonals, where all elements are 0 0.01, so basically average uh, variance of the stocks. And now our problem is what is the weight of the unit matrix? This weight is denoted row in the formula over there. Essentially, we need to evaluate how much noise and how much relevant information there is in the sample covariance matrix. The more relevant information there is, the greater weight it should have, and the more noise there is, the more weight the unity matrix should have. This is essentially the approach. To measure information, we need to calculate the parameter that's called delta squared, and delta squared is a uh, basically a deviation of our sample matrix from the unit matrix. So essentially, how much information there is in the sample covariance matrix as compared to the matrix that presumes zero correlations and the same variance across the board. For that, what we need to do is we need to sum the deviations of the unit matrix from the sample covariance matrix and square them. That results in a delta square mm, parameter of 0 0.0041. And now we need to compare it to some estimator of noise. And noise is given by a beta squared parameter that essentially measures the uh, deviations of month-by-month uh, -month, uh, covariance structure of stocks from our uh, sample covariance matrix. So how much does the matrix deviate from the sample covariance uh, each and every month, so how much noise there is, and we go uh, for each and every observations and then scale by one over number of periods squared. This results in an estimator of noise, and the ratio between noise and relevant information does give us um, an estimate of what is the optimal weight of the unity matrix in our Schrodinger's procedure. So let's implement the beta squared calculation here. So for the first month, say, uh, we can figure out what the um, observed uh, covariance structure for the first month is by calculating a mult of transposed d mean returns and the non-transposed d mean returns. We see that this gives uh, the uh, covariance structure in this particular month. Uh, then we would need to sum the deviations of this from the sample covariance matrix that we estimate, which is given over there, and we need to square those deviations and sum them up. So that gives an estimator of noise for this particular month at 0 0.0350. Now we can enforce it throughout, locking the sample covariance matrix. And we can see how much noise occurs 
month by month. So we see, for example, uh, this particular month, which is April 2020, had a lot of noise and uh, similar in March 2020. And we all know that those two months were quite noisy in the sense that uh, stock markets were moving in all kinds of directions during this point in time. So it's unsurprising that in this particular month, there was a lot of deviation in the covariance structure of our stocks from the sample covariance matrix. So the final procedure that we need to implement is to calculate the sum of the noise throughout the sample and divided by t squared. And that results in a beta squared estimate of 0 0.004. And essentially, the weight of the identity matrix, which is denoted rho, is the minimum of one. So if there's too much noise, uh, we'll just weight the identity matrix with a weight of one and do not weight the sample covariance matrix at all. But that rarely happens. It is just uh, kind of a circuit breaker on the procedure that Lidwein will uh, propose. And more, more importantly, the ratio between noise, beta squared, and relevant information, delta squared. And that results in a weight of 10.62% for the uh, unity matrix in our calculations of shrinkage. That, by extension, means that the weight of the sample uh, covariance matrix is 1 minus the weight of the unity matrix, and that is 89.38%. So there is some noise that warrants some shrinkage, but it's not really uh, that massive. And now, if we want to calculate the covariance matrix uh, for uh, the final shrinkage procedure, we can multiply the weight of the identity matrix times the identity matrix plus the weight of the sample covariance matrix times the sample covariance matrix. That produces a shrunk uh, covariance matrix that we can then use in all sorts of applications we would use an ordinary regular covariance matrix for. Say we want to calculate a minimum variance portfolio. In this case, we can compare the results given to us by a non-shrunk covariance matrix and a shrunk covariance matrix. So say uh, we're going to calculate the inverse of our sample covariance and the inverse of our shrunk covariance. We see that the elements of the shrunk covariance matrix are smaller because there is less noise that results in less explosive values when we invert the matrix. Now, for the purposes of minimum variance portfolios, we need a vector of ones with the same dimension as the number of stops we've got. We need to matrix multiply a vector of ones on our inverse covariance matrix. So both for the um, non-shrunk and shrunk covariance matrix. And the minimum variance portfolio would be the ratio between the elements of this resulting vector divided by its sum. And what we can see over here is that the minimum variance portfolio calculated by the non shrunk variance matrix has more short positions and more sizable exposures to individual assets. Say so it has a maximum exposure of 40% to Walmart, whereas the uh, estimator of minimum variance portfolio based on the shrunk covariance matrix has this uh, exposure at only 30%. Similarly here, a 32% exposure to Coca-Cola translates to only a 22% exposure. Similarly, the short positions become a lot smaller. Essentially, this minus 12 um, short position in Bank of America Corporation becomes minus 7%, and so on and so forth. But what is even more uh, crucial for understanding of this procedure is that it becomes uh, more and more relevant as the sample size reduces. So let's say we have not five years of data, but rather three years of data. So let's delete our data up until uh, September 2021. If we do this, then the weight of identity matrix that is given by the calculation procedure increases and the differences between optimal portfolios 
if estimated uh, without shrinkage and with shrinkage would be even more drastic. So here we see that, let's say the optimal weight of Walmart would have been 60%, instead of 1.16% when you shrink the Kameris matrix. And similarly with short positions, this short position of minus 41% uh, is reduced by more than uh, half uh, in the shrunk procedure. And at the extreme, if we have got, say, only 12 months, but 14 stocks, let's see what happens to our calculations. As we have got less time periods than stocks, the non-shrunk covariance matrix is uninvertible. We see those numbers are extremely large because they explode due to insufficient rank, but the shrunk covariance matrix still performs well. And we see how nonsensical those weights are, say, whereas the weights of the minimum variance portfolio calculated with the shrunk covariance matrix remain quite credible and quite uh, reasonable. And that's all there is for the application of the shrinkage procedure to the covariance matrix as per Ledwine-Wolf 2004, and its applications to simple portfolio management tasks. Please leave a like on this video if it's helpful. In the comments below, I make to see any first suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you'd like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and send support on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.